Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Demand Gen Chat. I'm your host, Kaylee Edmondson. And today we are joined with Brad Smith, co-founder and CEO over at Sonar, also the founder of WizOps. So we can get into that a little bit too. Um, I guess I should say Wizards of Ops, but it sounds wrong when you say the full title. So anyways, WizOps is a great community for anybody who's listening that maybe hasn't heard of it. Um, but yeah, can you kick it off just a little bit about yourself and kind of how you landed at Sonar, your background, you know? A little bit about, Absolutely. about yourself. Of course. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be here and chat all things RevOps and demand gen. Uh, so before we go too far into the world of Sonar and what we do and why we do it, I, I think it is pretty important to understand the background as to how we even got here. Uh, so prior to starting the company, my background almost exclusively has been in operations. Uh, the, the cool part about that, it's before we actually hit this huge wave and influx that we're now calling RevOps. Uh, my first operations role was actually professional services operations. Uh, you don't really see that title too much anymore, but I was working for a services company. And so it made sense. Uh, but along the way, my titles have been uh, professional services ops, sales ops, evolving into rev ops, uh, both at the manager level and director level. Uh, but I think the the reality of my background is that uh, we really wouldn't be where we are from a Sonar perspective if we hadn't walked the mile uh, in the RevOps shoes that, uh, that a lot of folks that are listening to this are, uh, are currently walking. So, um, But to, to sort of sum that up, as you mentioned, on uh, Sonar and WizOps, uh, co-founder uh, of both uh, CEO over here at, at Sonar. And uh, again, we're a change intelligence platform built specifically for uh, the operations professional to help manage and harness their operations uh, across their company and leverage their go-to-market tech stack in a more meaningful way. Yeah, yeah. And what at what point in your career did you realize there was a huge gap in the market? Like, were you in a role? I'm guessing you were. You were like an IC in a role, feeling a pain, and then just decided, okay, this is enough. I have to do something to try and fix it. Absolutely. Well, so the the first time that that first ops role, um, when I was professional services ops at a company here in Atlanta called Klaus Sherpas, they <clears throat> excuse me ended up exiting to Accenture a few years back, but. Uh, I remember vividly the first day of work, my boss was, uh, you know, getting me set up on my laptop, giving me access to all the different systems. And I remember him saying like, all right, here's your, your Salesforce access. Uh, you're an admin now. Don't screw it up. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean don't screw it up? And he's like, well, this system is where we keep all of our information. It's, it's the lifeblood of this company. Uh, and it can be kind of volatile. Um, you can absolutely make one or two changes here or there and ruin somebody's day, delete data, uh, mess up integrations. And so that was sort of the first aha moment that we had, or at least that I had along the way. But it really wasn't until the last two roles prior to starting the company when I was at two other uh, companies here in Atlanta that I was owning, managing, and running the go-to-market tech stack. So think your CRM, your sales intelligence or sales engagement tools, uh, your market automation platforms, uh, e-signatures, customer success platforms, et cetera. All those systems are talking to each other. And sadly, even in that role and at my previous role, Terminus, we didn't have a way of mapping out how all these systems were communicating. And that was a lot of the catalyst moments for what helped us start Sonar. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And then too, I think even your background in WizOps, you hopped on the importance of building community, I guess before it was like trendy. I feel like now that we've all been trapped at home for a year and a half, for almost two years, like now it's very trendy. There are tons of communities out there, but WizOps has been around, I feel like forever. Maybe I should have looked up the date of when you actually started it, but I feel like I don't really remember a world without it. So like what motivated you to start that before it was like the cool thing to do? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll key in on the, the cool thing to do because you're right, a lot of companies and a lot of communities are popping up left and right. And a lot yeah. of companies are driving that community growth. Uh, and I get this question asked a lot, you. Brad, did you start WizOps to help fuel and power Sonar? Like, not really. We actually started WizOps before we started Sonar. Um, right. And it was a, it was a, pure, it was a purely organic play. We were, uh, it was me and a guy that I was working with at the time at Terminus. I saw him actually like texting with a buddy of his, like, hey, I'm running into this issue, you know, the CPQ configuration. You're an expert in this. How can we fix it? And I just looked over and I was like, you know, why don't you Slack him that instead of you know, taking your cell phone and taking a screenshot of the screen, why don't you actually Slack him? And uh, his first line was, we're not in the same Slack community. I was like, well, that's easy. Slack's free. Let's just put this together. And 
prepare it actually fruit really organically. Um, you know, obviously even uh, Scott Haney at, at Chili Piper was a very early member in WizOps and still talk to him, you know, constantly now about yeah. what's evolving in the Red Ops world and, and just in operations in general. But it is a very much organic growth uh, pattern that we hit with it. Yeah, right, which I think is critical. And I think it's just not how a lot of communities are growing these days. So it's just interesting that, yeah, you're like, no, it just kind of took its own wings and ran with it, which is great. Um, I think it's just because it's so niche that there's not a lot of, and especially not when it was started, there just wasn't a lot of buzz in the op space yet. Um, so it's like a niche that was really needed because yeah, I do the same stuff guilty, right? Texting friends and like even creating like side Slack groups now with like a couple of buddies that I need to keep in touch with that just seem, you know, we have the same viewpoint on demand gen tactics and we just like hash it out on Slack. But yeah, it's like the power of a community is unreal, especially here, right? I feel like we obviously have been to Scott all the time with problems or concerns or challenges. And he's like, I don't know, let me, let me get in here and ask my buddies. Um, so it's like truly an extension of our own team. And especially for like feedback for how other people are doing it. You just can't get that like at scale without going to like some type of really well-built community. It really is. And, and you think about uh, there's some parallels here between demand gen and operations. Most demand gen teams, I'm going to put air quotes around teams, uh, and companies are, are fairly lean. You, you might have one, sure. two, three resources, um, but it's not as big as the sales team. It's not as big as the uh, customer success team where, uh, same thing on the ops side, there's usually a one or two or three or four person army that's supporting a very large group, which we'll talk about, you know, how you scale that in a second. But you don't have a lot of avenues to go and like, you know, turn around and tap someone on the shoulder, like, hey, I'm running into this problem. What do you think? So if they're not in your four walls, now obviously four walls are, are virtual these days, uh, you do need an outlet to go find people to see if you can pressure test a solution. How are other people solving it? And I think that's been the beauty over the last, especially 18 months with uh, the pandemic that we're experiencing. You know, it's connecting a lot of like-minded folks that can help problem solve together. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, to lead to your next point, just around like, okay, obviously, um, Brad here's an ops guy. We haven't had any ops people on the series yet, but it's super critical to just understand how this marriage should work between demand gen and ops, um, whether it's marketing ops or a full on like rev ops function. But yeah, I want to understand your perception of like what exactly rev ops is, where it sits within the org, more importantly, like when you stand it up within the org. Um, and just kind of riff on your thoughts around the philosophy of RevOps for a sec. Yeah. Well, uh, before we talk about what it is, I'm going to do a favor for everybody that is probably listening here that's in RevOps, and we're going to say what it isn't. Uh, RevOps <laughs> is not your Salesforce admin. RevOps is not your you know, business systems. It's not your IT department. It's also not your, your help desk. Um, and sadly, Sometimes that gets uh, miscommunicated or portrayed the wrong way in, in organizations. And so hey, we'll, we'll fight the good fight here and tell everybody what it's not. But um, more importantly, what is it? Um, it is the support of your go-to-market teams. And it's the lifeblood of how your go-to-market teams are communicating correctly with each other, how their business processes align, and of course, how we're using technology to facilitate that communication. But um, if you are in a revenue-centric role, sales, marketing, customer, for success, even on the finance side, you in RevOps are supporting those functions to make sure that revenue is following through your funnels the right way, going down to your customer side of things, make sure we're billing people the right way. Um, it's really following the customer journey from a data level where you're watching these customers come in, demand gen side, on your website, and they're going to a form. How are we making sure that that information is going directly to the right people at the right time, and we're communicating the right way? Full circle. Uh, 365 days from the time they come a customer, you want to make sure they continue to be a customer. So it's the entire customer journey. Yep. And then when should these people like, right? At some point, there's been an evolution, right? We used to have sales ops, marketing ops. Everyone used to be really, really siloed. Obviously, there were issues with that structure, which is why RevOps has been created, a centralized structure that sits in the middle. But I still feel like a lot of companies are almost living somewhere in between, the, like in between that status. like how do you just rip off the bandaid and fully stand up like a dedicated centralized operations function that's not still like halfway living in this like divided siloed land versus just like committing? Like, why do you feel like some people haven't made the jump yet? So this is one of the, candidly one of the biggest questions we get asked both with, within WizOps at Sonar, how we 
supposed to adopt this new methodology, right? Right. Uh, and sadly, I, I, mean, I have to just call it out. There's no perfect prescription for it. There's not a time where I can say, you know what? You're crossing the 49 employee mark to 50. <laughs> yeah. Exactly when you incorporate this methodology. But I, I will start with just saying, when should you hire operations? Before we go on the RevOps side, when should you hire operations? If you're already asking that question, there's a probably a good reason why you're asking it. So just go ahead and hire it. Uh, mm -hmm. Sadly, operations from a higher perspective in most companies is a reactive measure. It's when the house is on fire, let me call the fire department. You know what? We can probably help ourselves here and not have the house on fire if we think a little more proactively. So benchmarking, a lot of companies start bringing in operations around the 50 headcount. Um, my advice is always to think a little bit ahead of that, especially in the world that we're living in now where we have so many different systems that we need to orchestrate. It's so much access to data. If you let that data get out of control early, you're, you're never going to get control of it yet. So uh, my, always, my advice always is, is hire early uh, and hire often. But for the companies that already have one or two maybe ops folks that are in silos and they are contemplating, hey, should we adopt this RevOps methodology? My best advice is figure out what problems you see in your company right now that you're trying to solve for. Um, because I do think a lot of people, especially in the buzz of it all right now, RevOps is a big buzzword, right? There's 400% growth mm -hmm. year over year on the RevOps title on LinkedIn. And don't fall into the buzzword trap. Actually identify some problems that you're seeing. And some of those problems are, is our data actually moving through the funnel the right way? Like I said, you know, if we're sitting here doing all these demand gen tactics and we don't have a good way to see them, one, go down funnel to our, our inbound SDRs or our AEs, whatever your model looks like, probably a good indicator. Uh, if you're having trouble measuring the side of like, is this actually working? We know we're doing a, a strategy. I get all the demand side thing. You know, are we spending money in the right places? Are we advertising the right places? Are we getting the right communications out at the right time? Hopefully you are, but if you're having a hard time measuring the impact of that and downstream, like how are those efforts turned into dollars? Probably a really good time to think about RevOps. The uh, same thing, again, I won't go too long with department by department, but if, if you're starting to find these friction points, whether it be sales to marketing um, or marketing sales, sales to customer success, even sales to finance, if things are dropping through the cracks, you need a mind in your company to come in and operationalize that. It's business process and leveraging technology to make sure that it works the right way. So that's probably the best key indicators that I would, uh, I would look for. Yeah, and I think too, like even to speak on the benefits of having that team centralized and not siloed, like it, I feel like that used to be just standard, right? Like almost every team had their own little ops arm, but then those little ops arms just don't talk to each other. So we like, so still it's not solving the problem and making sure that your tech stack is talking to each other all the way through the funnel. Um, whereas like us, we call Scott, Scott bot, cause he is just the <laughs> backbone of our entire company and very robotic about the nature of things he's able to accomplish in 24 hours. I'm just unsure of when that guy sleeps, but Scott bot for all intents and purposes for us is our backbone because he is our ultimate source of truth to make sure that all the rest of us are communicating to each other, like as humans and as teams, yes, but also to make sure that our tech is talking to each other because without him, it doesn't, right? Like we keep our data, sales keeps their data, CS has their own data and their own tech that supports it and none of it is integrated unless you have someone sitting truly like in the middle of this spider web, making sense of everything. You're, you're spot on. And we've all felt that happen, whether we know about it or not. Yeah. Especially if we're, if, if anybody here is, the, especially on the, the leadership, excuse me, the leadership side or the executive side, you felt this pain before and, and you didn't know the solution was going to be RevOps, but we've all been in these uh, either board meetings or anything like, you know, of the such where you're saying, Marketing, how was last quarter? How do we perform? So, well, we created $5 million in new pipeline. It was great. It was a great quarter for us. And you know, they passed that baton down to the sales guy or girl. And she's like, I didn't see $5 million come in on the pipeline. I saw $3 million come in on the pipeline. And it will stop there. That, that trickle down of like data not facilitating itself department by department is one of the most tragic and hard conversations to have, especially in a group setting because it's a bunch of finger pointing. That is where you start to realize, all right, we do need this overarching group or person, whether it be a, a team of RevOps or a single person, orchestrating and making sure we're all marching to the beat of the same drum and measuring it the right way. Uh, but the, the better you have that management of it, the better your data is going to be for sure. 
Exactly. Right. And I almost feel like um, you hit the nail on the head for something else that was like top of mind. It's just like, when do you know? It's like, I feel like at least in my own personal background, Mops has almost always rolled under me. There's in a demand gen performance marketing function because I need job security <laughs> to ensure that the money I'm spending is also being tracked and converting down funnel and actually turning into pipeline and like revenue. Right. Because otherwise I'm just spending tons of money for like with nothing to show for it. Um, so naturally I feel like marketing ops has somehow always become part of my job, but how do you know, and I'm guessing you just kind of alluded to it a little bit when numbers and such down funnel aren't adding up, but at what point is it like critical that that becomes a dedicated function and not just something that's like being absorbed by demand gen marketers in general? Yeah. So we use this analogy often on the on the ops side in general, but it, it's a perfect segue for demand gen as well. Um, a lot of what you're doing is very strategic, and you're you're sitting there like, how do we go and make sure that we're hitting the right audience, hit them at the right time via the right channel? Uh, that takes a lot of brain power, and I know that. Like we we sit here and do demand gen, you know, we have a whole team that's uh, complete badasses that help do this. It's a very strategic role. Now, when you identify the fact of like. Am I spending my time wisely being strategic, thinking about these things, or am I spending my, my time tactically trying to orchestrate systems talking to each other, or did this data move this way, or, oh man, now I have to do a data load to like retro this and make sure these things the right way. You're spending too much time in a tactical effort and a hands-on system orchestration effort, which candidly is probably not a sweet spot for most demand gen mm -hmm. folks. Uh, again, the sweet spot is here's this channel, here's this avenue, here are the people and the target uh, the target audience that I'm trying to go reach. That takes, again, a lot of brain power, a lot of effort. That sadly will get minimized the more tech you throw at it because you now have to architect, orchestrate, and administer or clean up messes uh, mm -hmm. when they break. And that's, that is, again, when you start to feel that pain or even if you can foreshadow that pain ahead of you, you know you're going to go spend a lot of money on three new tech systems that you know you're not the expert in the room to orchestrate those things, highly suggest starting to talk to somebody who uh, who has that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially like if you're standing a new tech stack, but also if you know that like your marketing budget is about to explode in the next quarter, two quarters, whatever, if you have enough like foresight to understand like how much money you're supposed to be spending in the next six months, eh, like you should probably get a dedicated human to help. Um, Cause yeah, I feel like otherwise I, the firefighter analogy um, and even just like cleaning up messes Yes, like hard head nods to those statements because I feel like, yeah, it's very easy and very, it happens quick. I feel like it's a slippery slope where you just find that you're spending almost all day like manipulating Salesforce reports or like manipulating very specific field data in HubSpot to make sure that it's all syncing properly to the right place in Salesforce. And then, yeah, having to like data load manual things up into Salesforce that weren't working. Like what a waste of time, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's just overlooked a lot. Yep. That's, that's exactly <laughs> it. You know, you look at the progression of how all these companies grow. I mean, we all go through growth patterns where we don't have a marketing automation platform yet. We're just doing this manually and we're, we're moving spreadsheets around. Then we graduate. And then we do go to that, that first marketing automation platform year, two years, three years, four years later, we, we know we need more sophistication and we, we graduate from that platform and we move to the next one. When you're doing those transitions, and again, if your background isn't in system configuration and orchestrating these, uh, you know, these pieces of tech, that's another key signal for you to like, you know what, I need an extra set of hands to make sure that we do this the right way. Because candidly, if you do it the wrong way, you're going to spend twice as much money with a consulting firm or anybody else to really get this done the right way or fix it. Right. To fix it. Right. It's a lot easier to go ahead and stand it up on the front end and invest early instead of wasting time, just like untangling the existing spider web you spent time building without realizing. That's it. This is me putting my, my old consulting hat on, but it's, uh, it, trust me, it's cheaper to do it right. The first time you will sure. pay for it. Two X five X 10 X if you get it wrong the first time. So, um, but that always requires having the right people at the table at the right time to help you. Yeah. 100%. Um, so over the last 18 months, obviously tons of things have changed, but I feel like obviously RevOps, you're saying it's grown like 400% in search volume or LinkedIn titles in the last couple of months. What are some of the critical things that you think you can identify other than the fact that we've all been trapped at home um, for the last 18 months that are like causing this surgence of like importance in this type of title? And then like, what does that look like for next year? Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, 
fire up the DeLorean and we'll go back in time for a second. Five, you know, five, maybe seven years ago, you looked at a lot of companies and they had one person doing a lot of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but you had your sales ops person or your marketing ops person. They were wearing a million different hats. And we're realizing that this persona now is stretched more across uh, different teams. Obviously, that's the, the, the entire RevOps movement. But to answer your question correctly, why you think we're seeing the, the surgence of more folks? Well, technology is getting pretty sophisticated. Uh, we have more access to data and trends and systems that we know what to do with. And sadly, it's not, well, maybe not sadly, actually, fortunately, it's, uh, it's not a one person shop anymore. Like one person cannot fully do the job. And so what we're starting to see, again, are these RevOps teams happen. And that's why you're seeing such a, a, a surge of the role and of the title. But I think the cool part about that is you're seeing the diversity of these teams in, in focus areas. So if you're building your RevOps, you have a couple of ways you can go about doing it. Uh, you can have you know, a head of RevOps and you have a RevOps manager that's supporting marketing, a RevOps manager supporting sales, or a RevOps manager supporting other groups. You're not really breaking down too, too many silos, but at least you're overarching, like watching how the data is moving. But I think what's really cool, we've seen a couple of our customers do this where they have principal focus areas. And so, yes, they'll have that RevOps leader and then they'll move into, all right, who on this team or, or inside this RevOps team is going to work on the enablement side and training and coaching? So we're seeing sales enablement kind of move into RevOps. You're starting to see, obviously, uh, system architecture. You're seeing Salesforce admins become RevOps managers and truly focusing just on how these systems communicate. Then you're starting to move what used to be a, a business analyst. You're starting to move data analytics and business analysis into it because we have access to all this information. Whose job is it to watch it and understand the trends, foreshadow or, or forecast what the next thing that we should be focusing on is? That's why I think we're seeing such a, a surge of the role because candidly, the, the technology and the, the world that we live in now is more complex than it was a handful of years ago. Yeah, no, that's super interesting too, even just to understand, yeah, what the structure itself is breaking breaking into and like how people are finding ways to innovate and even make that um, leg of their business just like a little bit more operationalized and functional. Um, because yeah, I think like the most like phase one of this was just like, okay, move your marketing ops human into like a rev ops pyramid. And then you have one person who's owning rev ops, but really you're still just talking to that marketing ops person, even though they're not on your team anymore, it doesn't really change much. Um, but no, it's interesting, like almost to own a principal instead, because it really does like pull together those data points in a way that's much more meaningful. Right. I feel like that's also our problem. We have maybe everybody's problem. We have so much data. So like, yeah, whose job is it basically full time to just make sure that like, are we even using this data or we just have like an inundation of enrichment data and we're not like really doing much with it. Um, because I feel like that's probably a problem at scale, right? Almost everybody has to be dealing with that right now. Absolutely. Well, and, and you start to see in, in companies, you know, even you know, the, the growth stage startups side of things, you know, the series A, the series B, the series C companies that we're all in, we, we realize that that's essentially around the time you start bringing in new leadership levels into these departments. You start bringing in CMOs and CROs and uh, chief customer officer, officers and things like that. They all have a playbook. They all have something, a way that they want to track that data. And what ends up happening is you know, that that new leader comes in or a new resource comes in, like, I need to track it this way. Let's add seven new fields, a couple more mm -hmm. automation, how we, how we can track it. And we look up 12 months after that, that influx of people joining the company, like, man, which ARR field are we actually looking at now? Or which MRR field are we looking at now? Or contractor and, and things all the way down to that. First name, last name, email, title, secondary title, things like that. It can it's very confusing. And I'll tell you one of the coolest conversations that we've had, and this is kind of going outside of even RevOps and even uh, demand gen, but it, it's worth noting a lot of the mentality and the methodology that we need to start following, we can actually take a play out of products book. Um, you know, if you think, if you walk a mile in a product manager or an engineering's role, they have to ask why a lot. And it's a mm -hmm. really good philosophy to follow. Like, you know, somebody is always going to say like, hey, I need your platform to do this. And if you don't ask why, you're just going to go build it. It probably won't go very well. But a, a product manager is trained to ask why a lot. Well, why do you want that? Oh, it's because I want to accomplish this. Well, well, why do you want to accomplish that? Oh, because this is how it moves the needle for our business. Oh, well, if that's the case, you don't need the first thing you requested. You need this new thing that we're about to roll out. Ops can take a page out of that book and say, why do you need that field? Oh, well, I just need to track competitors. Well, but, but why do you need to track competitors? Well, I need to understand who we're losing to. 
okay, so now we, we're realizing we need to put this now more towards the opportunity side of things. You know, why, why else do you want to track that? If you just keep drilling and drilling and drilling, you'll find either two things. You already have a good way of tracking it because you're doing enough discovery or you're actually going to do enough discovery and go build the right thing. But it starts with asking why more often. And that does help reduce the amount of data that you're just arbitrarily throwing into your system. Yeah, exactly. No, and I feel like obviously Scott is like in the loop with you guys because that's all he does is question us all day. And anytime we ask for anything, which is great, like obviously he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But yeah, he does. It's always a quiz or like an interrogation really where he's like, do you actually need that? Are you super sure? Um, and almost always it's like, hey, we actually already have that. It's called this. Like, so no, we're not duplicating data fields for you for no reason. Um, but yeah, like as you grow and scale, right? Like we've never had a CS platform. We just got a CS platform this year. Um, that came with like a slew of new fields that they wanted to track, but like most of them were already in there. So we just needed to find a way to be able to like leverage that data better for them, which also then actually allowed marketing to leverage a like a closer relationship with our CS team that we didn't have before. Um, but yeah, I think that's just like part of the, like, I guess pros and cons of growing pains, but, um, yeah, working through the why I think is critical and. I've definitely worked for companies where obviously their Salesforce person did not ask why. Um, so we just had lots of fields and then, yeah, we're trying to do board reports and nobody's even sure like which fields are accurate because all the data is also like misleading and doesn't match. You're spot on. And you just, you hit a big <laughs> one anytime, you know, four times a year, you're going into that, that board reporting session or that next board meeting, uh, for all demand gen folks on here, if you want to become best friends with RevOps buy them a coffee, buy them a beer, especially in those four times a year. It is stressful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. And this is the mile that I was used to walking in a terminus at Klaus Sherpas and gather was you, you, you kind of get to sit back and orchestrate and build a lot. And you're working with your team to do that. But every quarter you're in crunch mode and you're in a two week little sprint where the entire executive team's asking for this trip. What was our conversion rate last quarter? How are we looking at, you know, demand gen, which channel's working the best? Cut them some slack, give them some high fives, give them some coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a drink every once in a while, buy them lunch, but it is tough and, you know, it ebbs and flows. But it's, when I say at the very beginning of this, it, it becomes the lifeblood of an organization. And I'm sure Scott can attest. I'm sure he has Nicholas asking four times a year or probably even more, hey, I need these reports. I need these dashboards. I need these trends. We're going into our board meeting. And mm -hmm. If there's anything that a RevOps person gets just gratification for, they want that. They all want that question asked from them, from their executives, because they want to help drive the business forward. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, yeah, four times a year, it's pretty critical. But also, I think, um, tacking back to your point earlier about re what RevOps is not, um, a help desk, I think, is the one that hits the hardest. Because unfortunately, especially for Scott, I'm sure we're like name dropping him a lot. I'm going to have to let him know that we're like, just going to talk about him singing <laughs> praises on this entire episode. But especially for Scott, he unfortunately is our help desk. And like, I realize he shouldn't be, but he just knows everything. So I think it's also like documentation or having some type like guru. Obviously we just invested in guru. So like now we have guru cards. If we looked at activity, I'm pretty sure Scott's probably the most active user in there because he's now trying to just like do a good mind meld to get all of this just like historical data out of his brain and into something that's documented so that he is not our help desk because he is just literally in the center of every single thing we're doing. So unfortunately that means he is our knowledge bank. Um, but yeah, so also like investing in tools like that so that poor Scott can like sleep at night and not have to babysit all of us all the time um, has been like so critical for our growth and like even just for his own like sanity. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he has a hard job knowing Scott for as long as I have, uh, it's always fun catching up with him. Cause the question I ask all the time is what are you working on now? And I remember over the years he's worked on payroll. He's worked on recruiting. He's worked on renewals. You name it. He's worked on it. Uh, super sharp guy. Obviously that's why he's uh, doing everything he's doing with you guys. So. Yeah. No, love him. He's a saint as I'm sure most RevOps people are right. They probably all almost become a knowledge bank and will resonate with some of this stuff that we've said today. Um, one of the last questions I always like to ask is if you could, um, recommend another marketer or for, in this case, RevOps person in the space that you are following along and find value in listening to their content or reading their blog or whatever it is, who would it be and why? Ooh, how much time? <laughs> I've got a list. Go, go, go. Um, well, who's yeah, at the I mean, top of your list? <laughs> top of my list. Um, I'm going to at least go with three. Uh, 
mainly because they're they're close friends of ours, they're customers of ours, they're folks that I've just I've held very very close to me uh, over the years to learn more about RevOps because by all means I'm I'm not an expert, um, but Rosalind Santelaneda by far like uh, one of the best folks in in the content world to watch on the RevOps side of things, and she does a great job of articulating the impact of RevOps across your entire business, not just why is it important to me, but why is it important to marketing, to sales, to success, to everyone. Um, She's absolutely amazing. Uh, Jeff Ignacio, a uh, long time, like very early WizOps uh, guy uh, over at Amazon now. So smart, drops knowledge on everybody all day. Uh, but he makes it very relative. He doesn't make it technical. You know, you don't have to be a Salesforce admin or a systems admin of anything to know uh, or to understand the importance of what he does. Uh, and lastly, uh, Keith Jones. I've, I've known Keith, uh, a fun story for him. He's been a two-time customer of ours. Like, so I've got to watch him not only uh, work with Sonar, and we work with his team very closely when he was at Zenfoot, then when he moved over to Mural. But the cool thing that that he does he, when we're talking about a, a product management and engineering type mindset, he does such a great job of being so smart and articulate and meaningful in the way he orchestrates RevOps. He doesn't go and just build a checkbox field for anybody whenever they want. He very much pressure tests ask why five times, 10 times, a hundred times to make sure him and his team build it the right way the first time. And just watching him do that and the impact it has had, especially at Mural, they are absolutely destroying it right now and doing a great job at everything they do. Um, it's really cool to watch his direct impact make that company flourish. So hopefully three was okay. I know you asked for one, but I gave three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've uh, I've never had anybody be such an overachiever, but I will totally accept it. Obviously, the more the merrier. And we've never talked to anyone with an ops background. So those are great people for everybody to go and follow and just like learn more about the world of ops. And then just, of course, how you as a like demand gen leader or even a demand gen IC can get closer to people that are in the ops function because obviously it's critical to the success of yourself and your brand. Um I feel like you always have things going on on the WizOps front. Do y'all have anything cool that you can name drop coming up, events, webinars, et cetera, that people could attend or should register for? Of course. Uh, so we have uh, a webinar every other week. Uh, we actually have one later today, so I'm not sure how quickly people can register in the next few hours. But um, you know, follow us on wizops.org. Uh, we actually, one of the cool things that we did just drop, and I would recommend anybody watching this, uh, we had our one-year anniversary of our webinar series called Shops Talk. Uh, it was really cool because we we looked back in time at everybody that has joined the episodes. We've had over 20 episodes so far, and we kind of uh, melded all of their responses of, you know, what's the next thing for WizOps? What advice would you give for anybody looking to understand WizOps better? So uh, yeah, WizOps.org, there's a great post there about our one-year anniversary. And most of the folks, actually all the folks that uh, I just mentioned have been on our episodes before, so you can listen to them and get their uh, their knowledge. But uh, a lot of fun stuff as we wrap up the year. Obviously, um, so we're going to holiday mode early next year. We're going to get back out in the field, have a lot of live events, probably partner with our good friends at Chili Piper on a few of them. Um, and yeah, keep putting people together and helping solve operations problems. Beautiful. I love it. And if people want to follow you, LinkedIn? LinkedIn's great. Uh, Twitter, I would give myself like a B minus grade on. I don't, I don't tweet too, too often, but uh, yeah, LinkedIn's fantastic. Be sure, follow me, that's fantastic, but follow WizOps. We, we, we do a really good job of elevating our entire community. We're 3,600 people now. Uh, we really wanna make sure that, uh, that they get the exposure that they do so they can continue to elevate in their career. Beautiful, awesome. Well, I will link all the things that Brad has just dropped in the show notes for anybody who's listening and wants to follow these people um, or go and follow WizOps, become part of that community. Um, it's a really great and powerful community, so I would highly recommend. Um, even if you want to just be a lurker and just observe the conversations that are happening in the public channels, still super valuable. Um, can confess I have been doing that for years, so still would recommend that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the time and for coming on, and uh, we'll see y'all next time. <laughs>